The Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast, number 148. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. You were like the uh, carrot top of interviewers. Wow, how disappointing was that question? You did not just ask me that. That's a very big question. Never mind, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing the show. Wow, I can't believe it. I, I'm telling you, I'm I'm hooked. Nick, 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 Nick. Yeah, he's so awesome. He's um, so a good friend of mine. Welcome, everybody, to the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast, broadcasting from the COVID capital of the United States of America here in Wisconsin with the cases of COVID rising every single day. Man, I keep praying this thing ends, that we can see some sort of normalcy return, and it just seems so far away at this point. Don't lose hope, though. I'm not losing hope. Uh, My kids have been in school now over four weeks, and we've pretty much been problem-free, minus a case here here and there. But certainly we've not had to shut down any classrooms, and that's just been a blessing all the way around. So I hope that you're having similar situations. I know actually around the country a lot of kids aren't in school, and they are doing 100% virtual or some of this hybrid stuff where they go a couple days a week and they're home a couple days. Sure be nice to get back to where we were in January and February of this year, which just seems so far away from where we are right now. Uh, Anyway, we have a good source of entertainment for you today that will get your mind off of your daily troubles because we've got a very fun guest. Nicole Lear is joining me, and she's an award-winning actor, producer, and director who's got a movie that's destined for the Hallmark Channel called Romance at Crystal Cove. She is in the finishing stages of that film right now. We're going to hear a little bit about that. She also starred with Nicolas Cage in the film A Score to Settle, which is really funny. Something happened on that movie that not many people know about, and it happened because of Nicole, and she's going to tell us that story later on today. And then finally, we've got very interesting conversations about Robert Redford and some amazing directors like James Cameron. You'll want to stay tuned for those stories as well. I know I'm pitching things to you as... If I'm on a radio show and you can't just fast forward, I know you certainly can, but you'll want to stay for the entire interview because Nicole is charming, very delightful, and I think you're going to enjoy all of the stories that she's come here today to tell us. So let's get right into our interview of the week. Here is Nicole Lear. Nicole Lear, welcome to the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Sometimes I feel like with guests that maybe I'm not as familiar with when I get pitched them, like, hey, you should have this person on their show. They've got great stories. And it's like, I'm just not familiar with their work. But that doesn't stop me in going and trying to research everything I can about you. So to bring our audience up to the same speed that I got up to yesterday when I was prepping, can you talk to us a little bit about your start in the industry? Now, I know that you started on the Canadian broadcasting show. Uh, what was it? Edg- Edgemont Road? Hey. Well, you did you 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 did your research very well. Yeah, yeah. I started when I was really young um, on a TV show called Edgemont Road. It was uh, created by CBC in Canada, and I shot in Vancouver. Um, and I left home actually at a very young age, um, and I hadn't really been auditioning for very long. Actually, about a month or so, um, and I booked this TV show for five years. And it um, in a way, I always say that the Vancouver film industry kind of saved my life because they really helped me grow. And um, after that show, uh, my career um, did take off and I was very lucky and met a lot of people that helped take care of me and, and shaped me in my formative years. So I'm very grateful for that show. I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, you might know and the audience might know a few people that came from that show. Kristen Cook, uh, who was, um, she played Superman's girlfriend for a little while. Mm-hmm. And I believe she's on another show now. She works a lot, but we all started on that show, which is, and also who else started on that show? Oh yeah. A uh, Grace who does Hawaii Five O down in Hawaii. Okay. She started on that show as well. So yeah, we were all, we're all a happy little family back when we were little munchkins. <laughs> <laughs> now I would assume getting a role so early in your career can either ignite your passion for more or really put out those flames like, oh my gosh, this is so boring. I don't want to do this. What was it about those early roles that made you want to pursue more and more projects? 
I think it was really the people for me. Um, you know, I had this idea, like we all do when we watch movies when we're younger, that I want to be, that I wanted to be in the industry and that we want to be in the industry. And then when it finally happened, it was, it, it was, you know, you learn fast. There's a learning curve. I wasn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. Um, and I had to learn a lot of different things, but the people, the people really helped support me um, and make sure that I was doing okay. And I had a really amazing team around me. So it was really the relationships and the friendships. It was a really positive experience for me. Um, never boring. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I've ever had a boring day on uh, on set in my entire life. It's all because you never know what's going to happen. That's true. Um, and you're always working under time restraints or budget restraints or um, other situations that come up. So I've never I've never had a boring day on set. So I I, I was. I was I fell in love and was always ready for more. That's just kind of my personality too. I like a challenge. You do sound very outgoing, and I think that that <laughs> takes you a, a long way in connecting and getting those relationships that not only will help you in your current project, but can also, like you said, you stay in touch and you never know who you might have run into that is going to be your next job. It's true, and you. The funny thing is, you meet people in the strangest uh, places. I was a waitress for a long time, like a lot of actors and actresses. And through that, you know, I met different people like Sean Penn or Jack Nicholson. Um, and it's crazy, not that I've worked with them, but they always had a moment to have a conversation um, about acting or working in the industry with me. And so I'm very grateful. And you do meet people in all different sorts of places, for sure. How do you approach Jack Nicholson? Like, that's very intimidating, oh. I would think. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, so during that time, it was just before uh, I booked Edgemont Road, so really in the early, early, early stages of my career, and I was working in this restaurant, um, a lovely man um, who actually took care of me, um, uh, Sarah Dune was his name, he went by Fred, and we were preparing, we were across from uh, a hotel that a lot of people, the productions put all the actors up, and we knew that he was coming over for dinner that evening and we were preparing the VIP room. Wow. And so I was setting the table and I was like, I, I never really get um, intimidated just working in the industry. I just never have. I, I believe that everybody, you know, we're all just people. Mm -hmm. um, but this time he just walked up. I just looked in and <laughs> it was just me um, and him. And he's like, I'll have a pork chop. Cause he's really, he's known for that. He really <laughs> likes pork chops. And I just couldn't say anything. And he said, just sat down. He was very casual. Um, and I served him that evening and we got to chat. And then um, Sean Penn actually ended up joining him. Um, and we talked a lot. They were very, very kind and very opening, uh, open to me um, about talking to, about acting. Um, so it, it, for a moment, I was definitely shell-shocked. I was like, oh, my gosh, there he is. Because he looks. Jack wears the glasses that he wears that you see him um, in his movies. Those are his glasses. Those aren't, those aren't like prop glasses. Huh. They're his personal glasses. So it looks, you're like meeting the Jack that you've seen yeah. in all of the movies. It was pretty, it, it was pretty cool. I'll never forget that. It was, it was a moment for me. <laughs> Boy, Nicole, I'm telling you when I, and I've not seen too many like A-list celebrities in real life. Like uh, I was a few feet away from Tim Allen when I went to see Last Man Standing. He came into the audience for, uh, a little Q and a thing. And I was, I was blown away because some of these people, when you see them in real life, it's like, not only are, wow, you're a real person, but they just look so much more, uh, star like when you're standing right next to them, even just versus being, cause they play all these regular people on television. And then you see them and you're mm. like, Whew. I mean, and I don't get starstruck very often. We interview celebrities every week, but yeah. Just to be in that moment with somebody you've grown up with is just like, and like Jack Nicholson. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I could say anything. I, you know what I think it is? I think that we're really respectful of the work that they've done. And for some of them, they've helped shape our childhood. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been with them. We spent that time with them. So I always like to say people are like, Oh, starstruck. But I feel more like it's almost like we're in awe of their work. You know, yeah. because their work, we feel like they were a part of our childhood or a part of our lives, you know, depending on what kind of movies that you watch, they may have helped you get through a certain time in your life. And so it's like we know them, but then they get to know us. And so it's always this really cool thing. So I always feel like it's just we're in awe of the work that they've done and we felt like we've spent time with them. <laughs> 
Well, there was a moment when somebody was in awe of your work, so much so that they made a major change to a film. And I want you to tell us a little bit about your time working on A Score to Settle with Nicolas Cage, because something special (laughs) happened on that film. So tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have... um, well, I mean, one of my nicknames is Cabbage Patch Doll. I look uh, <laughs> a lot younger than I am. And so I often go out for parts where that they're, you know, the best friend. Um, and I, I happily go out for all of those parts. I know that a lot of things are going on in the world, but I always read the parts. And I do say no when I feel uncomfortable. But this certain part was actually a part where I was like, I'm just going to read for it and send in my tape um, and see what happens. Um, so I did the audition, I sent it in, and the cast director was lovely. Uh, she sent back a message, and she's like, Nicole, thank you so much. I just want you to know that, um, I don't know if you saw, but this part is actually written for a man. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, um, like, thank you so much. The work was great, but thank you, but no thank you. Um, and I was like, hey, no problem, but I just, I really feel like I'd like to, you know, if I can, like, re-audition for you and have you take a look. And I didn't really hear anything back. And then they got back to me and they're like, you know, we watched the tape <laughs> mm. and we were just wondering if you would mind uh, retaping for us one more time. I said, okay, no problem. And also we love the work so much. Would you mind reading for this other part? That's actually a female part. And I said, okay, no problem. So I retaped, retaped. Um, and then I got a call and they're like, you know, it was really good. Would you mind coming in? We're not going to bring the director or the producer in, but we just, we'd really love to see you do this in person hmm. um, for for this part. But it is written for a man, so you should just know, like, is it, you know, we're just, we love your work. We just want to see the acting work. I'm like, no problem. Absolutely, I will come in. Of course, yeah. So I go in, and at the end of the audition, both the cast members are like, you know what? She's like, we'd like to have you come back to the director producer session, but we just, we really want you to understand that this, this part is going to a nail. It's written that way, but we just want them to see this work. And I was like, thank you so much. You know, that's an honor when you're working so hard and you get in again, relationships, right? You get to meet another producer, another director that's working on a movie. Mm-hmm. So I came back and I was definitely, I wasn't nervous, but I was at that point. I'm like, okay, like I'm auditioning for something that, probably not going to happen. Like they've been very transparent with me, which I appreciate, but I went in and did the work. Um, it had worked with the director. He was amazing. Sean was amazing. And the producers were amazing. Uh, great people. And after I was walking down the hall, the cast director came running after me. She's like, Nicole, she's like, that was amazing. Are you available next week? Wow. <laughs> so they booked me like right on the spot. Um, and I ended up, they ended up changing the part from the mail uh, to a female for Woo-hoo. me. And the cool part about that is that they didn't really change the lines and they actually added um, a lot of lines. And I play a very hardcore character. Uh, my first line to Nick Cage when he comes in is he asked me, he's like, so you're running things now? And I say to him, why are you asking? Because I don't got a d-. And it was just one of those moments where the writers and it was just awesome. It was like that moment <laughs> where it went together and we did this scene. And at the end, he was like, good job, kid. And very supportive, amazing actor. He works in a method way. Um, and at the time, he was actually working on his three scripts. He had his three picture deal. Um, just an amazing, amazing artist to be able to watch, you know, for me, he's an Academy Award winning actor yeah. and I've watched his work for a very long time. And Nick Cage is somebody who just, he works, you know, he pumps out the work and it was a huge learning experience, but also, you know, the fact that he thought I did a good job. It, it was a nice moment in knowing that I was on the right path. It felt like a, a reassuring pat on the back, that like, keep going kid kind of moment. <laughs> did he know that the role had changed genders? Yes, he would have known, um, and he probably, I mean, I'm not sure if the director and the producer made that decision. I'm sure he would have, um, he would have known. We never talked about it, Um, but I do know that it was pretty cool because I know that he was surprised about how intimidating I could be. Ah. I'm not a tall person. I'm, I'm about five foot. Um, tall. <laughs> About five foot. I was waiting for another number. You're like, About tall. Five foot. <laughs> <laughs> around that, around that, um, give or take, depending on the part. Um, 
And I know that when he first met me, when we were walking into the set, I, you know, Nick Cage is a very tall man. Um, and let's just say he had no questions after that first date. I right. can be very intimidating and very easily. So it was one of those things where I'm sure when he first met me, he's like, really? This is the kid that's going to do this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm the kid that's going to do that. And let's do that. Um, and then we did the thing and it was great. So I don't know if he knew. But I'm 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 assuming that he would have had to know, especially, you know, I just finished directing um, a film and you kind of with your stars, you do let them know what's going on. And mm -hmm. there is a process where they know ahead of time a lot of different things that are going on. Okay. Um, so I think he would have known. Is he pretty intense on set? Like, is he very like method and he's got you can't really talk to him personally or uh, what's he like to work with? Well, we were we both work in a very method uh, way we had a great conversation um but i also wanted to just stay in my character because i was playing a character that is very hardcore um i didn't want to joke around before we finished shooting that scene and also for him in that point he had just got out of prison and he is coming to meet somebody to to buy guns and to kind of get his ammunition to go get his revenge. So it was a very intense moment. So there wasn't a lot of joking around. We talked. He's a, an amazing person. He's very kind. Um, but I, too, work in a method way. So yeah. after, we talked after, and I had bought him a, a bottle of wine. I just wanted to say thank you so much. And he was really, really kind, uh -huh. um, very professional, um, and definitely earned some brownie points with me. Like I've always loved Nick Cage, but after working with him, I was like, oh my gosh, he's a real artist. To be able to do the amount of films he does mm -hmm. in a year, I think somebody said, and I haven't fact checked this, but someone says Nick Cage right now in 2020, this around this time, he does he pumps out the most films ever um, of like foreign films and local films and those kinds of things of any celebrity. So he just really does film back to back to back. And also I think he just signed on to do Tiger King. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. In fact, he's yeah. got uh, episodes already taped, I guess. Cause, Oh, I guess it's his pre-production, but yeah, he's playing Joe exotic. Go figure. And he's perfect for oh it. Oh my God. Believe I it. cannot wait to see that. I cannot wait to see him do that. <laughs> That's hilarious. Now you mentioned two buzzwords yeah. for me. Uh, so I'm going to just bring this up and ask because everybody knows from who listens to the show regularly that I love the show Love After Lockup. Have you ever seen it? I haven't. Oh, my gosh. You're missing out. Oh, my God. All right. I'm writing it down right now. At Lock minimum, up. you should Google Sarah from Love After Lockup because you mentioned that you look like a Cabbage Patch doll. This Sarah yeah. woman from Love After Lockup uh, who is dating an, an ex-inmate absolutely looks like a Cabbage Patch Kid. In fact, there's some <laughs> very um, mean groups out there on Facebook that have, you know, put side by side shots and that kind of thing. Yeah, she's a total Cabbage Patch doll. Oh. So you mentioned prison and oh Cabbage Patch. I'm like, it's, all right, I got to ask. It's it's so funny that uh, people on the internet do things like that um, because they think that it's a bad thing. But in fact, especially as an actor, sometimes it just it's like kind of like free press, you sure. know, <laughs> they're doing yep. these weird things. I have a lot of people on the internet that I don't know what what their thing is, but they just I think what it is is that they just feel unheard sometimes, mm -hmm. and they think that if they can go after somebody, that maybe they might be heard. So I always try to like I don't entertain any negativity, no bullying, nothing like that. But I always try to find a way to connect with them, especially during the movement right now. I've had a lot of people who've brought up very intense issues on all of my social media. And it's really funny because a few of them I've been able to get through with and we've just had like a very human conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it helps. I think it helps when you have the energy. It is, it's not easy conversations to have, but they're conversations we have to have. Um, so I'm sorry that's happening to her. <laughs> I wish I could like give her a big hug, a COVID safe hug. Obviously. A COVID safe. <laughs> um, yeah. The only thing I was going to say about that is talking to people about these issues that ha are open-minded to change and possibility rather than those who are so stuck in whatever their thinking is that they can't be open to anything other than what they already believe. And that's where you're not going to get anywhere. But Yeah. It's, it's, I've had two people um, that I've been able to open, um, you know, and they've taught me some things for when the movement first started, 
recently I actually had like some white supremacist people reach out to me and they were sending me like a lot of hate mail via Facebook um, and attacking me a lot on Facebook and Instagram. And a lot of people were like, just don't talk to them, don't talk to them. And then I kind of thought about it and we all have to do what's right for ourselves. We all have to make the choice of like what we feel safe to do. And and I had the strength, you know, I had the strength to continue the conversation with them very safely. And I had a professor of communications help me. I was very supported with professional people wow. um, and I was safe. But actually one of them flipped and ended up, you know, not fully fully changing everything but actually seeing the light and apologizing and it was a moment that I'll never forget Um, and what had happened to her is she was defending a lot of the police officers that were doing these murders and these killings and I found out that something had happened to her um, and a police officer had did something to her so it was like wrapped in a personal situation and I think once you find out why they are whole, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of people are taught this from their parents, but some people have had individual issues happen to them. And that's what it is, right? We all feel like our story is the story. And we have to remember that it's every individual story um, takes time and effort. Um, but that was, that was a moment where I was very, very proud of her because although her beliefs are very, scared and um, not conducive of this world and we have to change them. And it, I was so proud of her for admitting her wrong because it's not easy to let a lot of that go even in its, it's, I don't know what the, the word I'm looking for, but you know, she, she was somebody who was very negative and did sure. not see me as even an equal. And now she does. Um, and I think that's a really big win, but it took <laughs> like two months of talking to her almost every day um, and her calling me all sorts, of, all sorts of names, but in the end, she did change. And I still talk to her. I keep my distance, like I said, for people who have the energy to do this. You do have to make sure you're safe and you do want to have professionals around. But I think that was a moment where I was like, I have hope yeah. in the people in the world. It just takes a lot of effort. Well, that's powerful. Yeah. And the time <laughs> you took to change her heart even a little bit, maybe she'll be able to go out in her world, in that world. And change those hearts exactly. as well. So, you know, everything spreads yeah. on. Let's move on to uh, talking about some recognition you received for a film. And I'm always amazed when people can perform two jobs on one project. So not only you were a producer <laughs> on the film Black Chicks, you also starred in it and earned a Leo Award nomination for your work. So tell me about producing a film, acting in it, and trying to stay in each role without crossing over and having too much, you know personal opinion about how you performed versus how somebody else might have thought you performed oh man you just made me so happy that's my I think that's my my piece of work in my in all the films that I've done that I'm the most um pleased with um that film meant so so much to me so I actually started doing the stage play I was working um out of James Franco studio in Los Angeles studio four Mm -hmm. um it no longer exists but at the time, I was putting up the play there. Um, and then I came home to work on some things. And I found out that the writer of the play, because it used to be, a, it is still a play, it's a published play by Mr. Neil Labute, okay. um, an amazing writer and a good friend of mine. And uh, I found out that he was working here. And I just decided to write him an email. We had a mutual connection. Um, and I just said, hey, Neil, <laughs> do you want to make this into um, a film? And I at that time, didn't know Neil very well. It was just through a mutual friend that I had known and had his email. And I was like, kind of maybe not supposed to email him directly like that. Maybe I took a little <laughs> bit of a, a risk. <laughs> I think it's okay. Um, if you can find their a, info, I, you know, you got to take a leap sometimes. Yeah, well, maybe I took the info from the mutual friend and the mutual friend didn't know maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, um, like that. <laughs> like really naughty stuff. Um, anyways, and I got an email back right away and it just said, sure. Um, and in about two weeks, we actually managed to pull it together. We found a location and then we cast a good friend of mine, uh, David Cubitt, who is a, an amazing actor and a very good friend. Um, so I was really lucky because again, Neil LeBute is an amazing writer director and we had so much support. We had the support of Keslo camera, 
Um, and we had amazing cinematographer Brennan Ugama, um, who's the cinematographer of Child's Play um, and Riverdale. So with those talented artists supporting me, the producing side was very easy. I always say that I'm a producer out of necessity okay. <laughs> because producing is so much work, mm-hmm. you know, like unless you're somebody like Octavia Spencer who gets to just produce what she wants. And obviously it's so much work for them as well, but then they have the team and the big budgets where they can have the people take care of a lot of the production side. When you're doing independent film, you do all the work. Um, So I had, you know, Brendan and Neil were amazing at pulling things together. And because I had done the stage play, I was very prepared for the acting side of it. Um, And we had a week of rehearsals. David had to get off. And it's a long play. Like, it's just two people talking. And it's about 12, 13, 14 pages, somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly. Okay. Um, And he had, like, four days to get off book because we didn't cut. We shot it the same way that the play is shot. So every take we did the whole play. Um, (laughs) And we shot in a day. It was like actually a really, that was probably one of the easiest days I've ever had on set. The most relaxed, the most chill. Um, Yeah. I'm pretty impressed. And Neil is just, I mean, I, his work is, is amazing. You don't read a piece of Neil's work and don't have, a feeling like you just almost have like a visceral feeling with every piece of his work. Um, you either hate it or you love it, but mm-hmm. you never feel nothing. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Well, and your co-star in that film, uh, I don't know if I'm going to say his last name right, but David Kubit, yeah. y- you might not yeah. like recognize the name, but when you scroll through his resume, you've seen him. Everybody's <laughs> seen this guy. Yeah. He's been in every show that like I've ever even checked out. This is crazy. Yeah. He is so talented. David, David is the most giving actor and the the dialogue that we had to work through in Black Chicks is very difficult. It's not his character has to say some of the most intense things that I've mm-hmm. ever heard a character say. And he just was his delivery is just amazing. Um, the film is up on my Instagram underneath the IG video. It's a, it's a short film. So we decided to put it up there and also on um, Neil LeBute's, uh web page, Contemptible. Uh, film so you can see it at both those places for free um but david is as far as i'm concerned he's one of the best actors <laughs> he's just he everything he says is so real there's nothing forced it's just continually amazing solid work one of the names you mentioned yeah. was octavia spencer and, and just yeah. amazingly talented and i actually didn't run into her until about 2017 when i saw the movie the shack uh, and it does look like you had a little bit of something to do with that project. I was curious if you could tell me, you know, what you had going on. Oh, my God. You know what? It's so funny. I have no idea how that credit is on my IMDb. And every once in a while, people will bring it up. I never worked. It says that I worked as her stand-in. And I didn't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's just like this weird credit that has like shown up on my imdb and a lot of people say that i look like octavia spencer they're like you need to meet her like you have to they always say that i should play her sister or her daughter Mm -hmm. um like people are like it's so crazy your resemblance is like you guys look like family and so i I hope that i really that i get to work with her one day or meet her one day i've never met her and this credit just showed up (laughs) and i love the shack because i love the kind of you know, the characters she plays are She plays God. Awesome, right? I mean, come you know? on. Yeah, she plays like these intense, crazy people. But then this other show that's on, I just checked out the other night. Um, it's called Truth Be Told, where she works with like Aaron from Breaking Bad. And she's this detective. It's this really, really amazing show. Um, and she's the lead. I was like, oh, man, maybe I can play her sister or her daughter yeah. one day. I mean... I hope I hope that that credit is there and people are like, oh, she looks like her. But I didn't work on the show. It's just this ghost credit that showed up for some reason. All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> we at least settled that that debate here. Um, but it was a great movie. Octavia is a great actress. And, and someday I would love to be able to chat with her, too. Yeah. So, Nicole, let's talk a little bit about uh, the fact that you've worked with some really big directors uh, who are stars themselves. So some of the names mentioned on your resume are Robert Redford. James Cameron, 
We already talked about James Franco. Uh, Seth Rogen's on your list too. So when you think about yes. working with these talented minds, what stands out to you? What memories do you have? I just remember when I worked with James Cameron, it was on a show called Dark Angel. Um, and I, at that time, was very young. That was a, one of my earlier credits. I think I booked that while I was still shooting Edgemont Road. Okay. And he was directing. And I remember not knowing who he was <gasps> and because I was so young. Yeah. So, and so I remember like everyone was like working and I was just chatting with him, you know, he gave like a few notes. My part wasn't big, but it, you know, I still was in for a little bit and um, a few notes here or there and just chatting with him. I remember it being very casual, but nothing, nothing much, nothing too, too much. Um, and then after I found out. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't know who he was, though, because oh, this was post Titanic. Girl, <laughs> yes, I'm aware now. Um, <laughs> so kind of an, another embarrassing moment, but I do, I did love working with uh, Robert Redford. Yeah, um, and Susan Sarandon. It was a very small part. I was actually a part of the production company. Um, I was an assistant to the producer. Um, and that was something that I went out to help with. They needed a car and they needed a person. That day was amazing. And there was people in the neighborhood where we shot um, waiting. Like they were camping out just to see. And they were older women, maybe in their 70s. And they had a sign that said, we love you, Robbie. And <laughs> <laughs> they Indeed. camped all day and um, at lunch, Robert actually went over and talked to them and they just about melted. I mean, I saw these women turn into 17 year old school girls. It was <laughs> adorable. And he always takes the time to talk. And, you know, it, it, it was it was it was heartwarming. It was the cutest thing you've ever seen. Just, you know, they still had that 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 love for their heartthrob. Robbie, they just were. It was so cute. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit about you working with famous people, but let's talk about, or, or even when you're watching other fans interact with the, your co-stars, but what about when fans yeah. find you, when your fans get a chance to meet you or you, you've encountered your fans, do you have any moments that stand out with like a weird fan or a very fun encounter with somebody who recognized you? Tell me a story or, or a couple, if you have about some yeah. fan encounters. I know. Yeah, I'm always so shocked because I, I feel like I'm still in the trenches, like working towards the thing. So I get really shocked. Like I'm like, I always ask them, I'm like, you mean me? <laughs> so I, I remember I was um, at a hotel in Beverly Hills and someone's like, oh my God, I, I you're the girl from this show. And it was an old show. They recognized me from this Together show really? that I was in. And I'm like, I'm like, are you sure you mean me? Like, I always question them. Like, they don't have <laughs> the right person. So I think they get confused. They're like, yeah, you're you're Nicole, right? You're an actress. And they have to affirm with me. So it's this really funny thing because I'm kind of confused or like they would recognize me, you know? And it, it, it's just funny for me because I, 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 I forget, you know, you're yeah. just a normal person and it's always so kind. So I'm always like, um, well, what show? I'm like, yes, I worked on that show. And, and they're like, and you were the actress? Yeah. So it's kind of one of those things where I like, question the poor fan. I'm sure they leave very confused. Like, does she know who she is? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it happens like almost every time just because I, yeah, I, I, I'm i flattered. I'm very thankful for the people who watch the films. You know, we all are in entertainment uh, for the people. And I, I'm I'm very flattered when I when I do get recognized. It's only happened a few times, maybe two or three times. Okay. Um, yeah, I think one of the times that I really my most famous person for me and the most kind of moment where I was like, oh, this is so cool is uh, when I worked with Ice Cube, and I worked with him on two movies, and I remember just like watching how people are around them, how they are just in awe of the work. And I think I'll go back to that because it really is that they're just these people who have shaped our childhood. Um, but I remember Cube always taking time for the people. And I'm so proud of Ice Cube right now for all the work he is doing uh, for the world and change and all of those sorts of things and always taking time. I always love to talk to people when they come up after I get over that moment of, you mean me? Are you sure me? They're like, yeah, you. I'm like, okay. 
<laughs> and try to just like find out and take the time to have a chat with them and find out how their day is going. You know, it's fun. It's fun. Now, I'm very thankful for all those people. Yeah. Nicole, you've seen so many stars interact with their fans that are, you know, bigger or more well-known or more, you know, uh, recognized. Do you see yeah. people change before that person would come over? Say like, um, not really in the Robert Redford situation, but maybe um, in another situation where people are like, they change who they are because, oh, now they're going to be in front of that star and then they go back to, you know, do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, do you see that that switch flip with fans uh, interacting with stars? I, I do, but I think it's really innocent. I think people are just so excited, right? So if you're on set and there, and it happens, you know, there's some extras and maybe you're at the crafty table and they're having a work conversation and then maybe um, some extras come over to get their snacks or whatever. And then they just kind of lose it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the, the super fans, they just have a moment, but it's so innocent, you know, and it really is that they're just so excited to be around the star sure, or yeah. this person and then the star will leave and they won't know who I am. You know, the, the person that's there, the co-star or whatever, um, or the director, whatever position I may be in on that day, they have no idea who I am. And I, I do look, you know, like a 19 year old woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then you see them like go into like, Oh my God, you know, they go back into them, into themselves, but it's really excitement. You know, like I don't, I think everybody is just really so excited, but you do see a little flip. You do see a little change. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to watch that change happen. I think we all have it. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to uh, pick your nose at a dinner table with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> You'd want to not do that. Right. So, yep. <laughs> I think you could take it to that simple, simple little to toilet joke like that. But it's true, right? You do want to present your best self. And yeah. it's the same when you're pitching and those kinds of things. So they're just excited. They get so excited. Um, and then funny things happen, too. You know, like they might drop their tea or their coffee or something like that, just out of nervousness. I've done that. I'm very clumsy around people. I get more nervous like that around my, um, around my producers or okay. my, um, like if I'm intimidated by, by somebody, like it could be anybody. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have really cool, like I'm really intimidated by people who have like amazing style. <laughs> like any, it could be literally anybody, like somebody who is just so, cause there's like in New York, people dress so well. Like, and I'm always like, oh man, like I, I love style. I love fashion. Um, recently I bought it like a bunch of hats, but I don't really know how to like put it together. Yeah. All I know is that my hat and my belt and my shoes have to match. And then you see these people that throw together these outfits so easily. And I'm just like, oh man. And I definitely drop my coffee a lot when I see good <laughs> style. <laughs> like randomly like throw it on myself. <laughs> so one of the jobs you won't have is the wardrobe person on a, on any project. Um, no, leave nope, it to somebody nope. else. And I love, yeah. And this last film that I just directed, uh, we had an amazing wardrobe stylist um, that helped me, and she was so great. I go to all the actors' fittings. Just it's another chance to meet and chat with them um, before you get to set. And wardrobe styling is it's a huge job. Yeah. It's an amazing job how they pull things together. Is that yeah. film that you're talking about, Romance at Crystal Cove? Yeah. Let's yeah, talk about Crystal that. Cove. You said the title could change, oh, so we won't hold you to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, with um, we'll see what happens. I'm pretty sure the title is going to stay Romance at Crystal Cove. Um, my directing debut, I'm pretty stoked Ooh. about it. I had the most amazing time. Um, we shot up in Kelowna and Wine Country. And I'm just about to go into post into my director's cut on Monday. I start tomorrow. And so I'll do that this week. And yeah, I'm like overjoyed. I was literally before we hopped on the interview, just watching uh, the editor's cut and starting to make some notes. And it's coming together really, really amazing. I'm so excited. Congratulations on that. Really cool people. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, you know, it's an amazing Thing to be an actor and to see your dreams come true and then to be able to have the extension of directing um, I feel so thankful that I get to do that and I'm 
I'm just so honored. Um, I definitely see myself moving into music videos and action and um, drama, but starting in romance was a lovely place to start. And I just, I can't believe, like I'm so fit. I really can't believe that I just finished my first film as a director. That's awesome. So, yeah. You learned a lot doing it? Oh my gosh, yeah. You learn a lot of um, that you can take into your acting. You know, I, it was Chris Rock who was like, after he directed his first, he had his directing debut, he's like, I'll never be late again. Mm. And I learned, you know, I've never been late. Time for me, I've always feel like if you're on time, you're late. That's something, even in LA with traffic, I'm always early. 10 minutes early, everything. Um, and even more so, like working as a director, you find out that as an actor, you really need to support the director. And there's certain questions. There's not a silly question, but I do believe on a film set there is the right time for a question. Okay. And I learned so much from all of the different departments. Um, and we had our struggles, you know, uh, we had a lot of struggles, but we also had a lot of amazing time um, on this set. And we were also, again, on this, I'm so thankful, sponsored by Tesla Camera again, um, who have been coming out on a lot of my shows since the beginning of, of my career. So I'm very thankful for them. Uh, Derek from Pacific Backlot, just all these people that have known me my whole career as an actor. And then when I did get this gig to move up into directing, um, so much support from the community. So I'm, I'm so thankful. Um, what else did I learn as an actor? You can tell the difference the way that you need to dial in your performance. There was this one actor that played a father um, and he had that, I could say, can you turn it down or can you turn it up? And he'd literally understand and be able to do it by one knot. He's this amazing actor. His name is uh, actor. Fred is his name. Okay. Um, and he was so talented at knowing exactly what I needed in the moment. It was just mind blowing how, how amazing he was. Hmm. Just mind blowing. What's the release platform for this movie? So it's the production company that produces Real One Productions. Um, and they have offices in London, Los Angeles, New Mexico, and Vancouver. Um, so they make the films and then they will sell the film. I believe they are looking at Hallmark for this. Um, but of course, we'll have to wait to see. Um, so probably Hallmark. Um, and I think it will be released in the UK first. Um, but all of this is just, mm -hmm. you know, it can all change with the sale and depending on uh, what happens. And I'm not involved with that. I leave that to my very talented uh, producers. Sure. Um, I have an amazing producer, uh, Jill, who, who at Real One gave me this shot. And I'm forever thankful to this production company. If you don't know who they are, you got to check them out. Real One Productions and um, tell them I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to stereotype really the funny. film, but when you name it Romance at Crystal Cove, it, it did scream Hallmark. I just didn't want to say it. Cause... Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I, you know, I played hardcore badasses and I love <laughs> me some action and thrillers, but don't get me wrong. On the weekends, I watch my Hallmark and I love it. Me I too. love it. It's There's something so relaxing about being able to sit down and know that everything is going to be okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good no sum. No matter what happens in the story, at the end, you're going to be able to breathe, you know, and I, I love that. I think that it's, I think that it's a beautiful genre and I, I'm definitely here to change. And I, and the cool thing about Hallmark is we have a brand new sister at the helm running things. And so they are making some amazing changes. And me, you know, like I'm a huge part of that, me as the first black female director, um, and I think they really are making huge changes and I'm so proud of them and we're seeing it in the stories, you know, we're seeing the brothers and sisters having full characters develop full stories, full storylines. And I'm really proud of it because it's not, it's not a change that we should have to make, but it's a, a change that we have all been awakened to. And the Hallmark is making that change. And I'm very proud of them Absolutely. for doing that. You know, because they had to say, again, it's like one of those moments where they had to realize, hey, maybe we're, we have to learn something. And it's not easy. <laughs> you know, when you have to say, I have to change, or maybe I was wrong, or maybe this, or maybe that, when you are the one that has to do that, it's not an easy thing to do. So I'm just so proud of them. And I love, I love, love, love that we have um, the head of the black uh, female 
it, it just, it's an amazing change. So I'm very proud of them. We watch a lot of Hallmark in our house, especially around Christmas time. I'm kind of concerned this <laughs> year that we're not going to have as many movies because I know they film in July and, well, that hasn't happened. So I don't know what we're going to get this winter, but um, it's definitely... Well, you're going to get romance at Crystal Cove. Uh, exactly. That would be great. It would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they're filming a lot. I know that in Canada, like I'm up here right now, I mm-hmm. um, can't wait to get home, but I do think that the still are filming safety. The protocols on set are amazing. Um, you get tested, masks, there's a whole COVID safety team. So I think um, you'll still have all the films. We're still working on getting the product um, shot safely. Um, I, yeah, I think you'll be surprised at how many films you'll you'll still have. Okay. So they're, they're on their way. You're giving I me promise. hope. <laughs> Nicole Lear, it's been a great time. Thank you so much for joining us on Fan Counters. Can you give us a rundown of where we can find you on social media and continue to follow your wonderful career? Of course. And Nick, thank you so much for having me. I My really pleasure. appreciate it. It was awesome talking to you. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram um, at Nicole G. Lear um, on Twitter Nicole G. Lear or Facebook at Nicole G. Lear. I'm on um, TikTok as well, but still haven't quite figured out that one. So Instagram um, is probably the best bet. Well, you enjoy the rest <laughs> of your the preview of your new movie. We are looking forward to seeing Thank it. Romance at Crystal Cove will be on the lookout for wherever that lands. And uh, we wish the best to you, Nicole. You're, you're on your way, man. I mean, all these projects that you've already done, it's a, quite a resume. And I think the best is yet to come. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick. I'll talk to you soon. You bet. Sounds great. My thanks to Nicole Lear for joining us on Fan Counters this week. We certainly appreciate her time. And man, she's delightful. I could interview her all day. And uh, she might be back. You never know. Fun guests like that, I would love to talk to you again. Be sure to come back next week. We've got another wonderful show with a comedian. Bubba Bradley is going to be here. If the name sounds familiar, it's because you probably saw him on Last Comic Standing on NBC. He will be on the show next week to tell us a little bit about his touring stories. He's got a lot of good ones, too. And then he's going to hang around with us after the episode next week because we are going to talk about the Smartless podcast again because Dax Shepard was a guest. And I I mentioned a couple weeks ago, or was it last week, that we might have that review of that episode. So we're going to talk a little Dax Shepard and Smartless again next week. So be here for that. Bubba is going to join us for that segment. And I have a very special guest host with me who's never been on the podcast before. So that'll be interesting, too. If you're looking for something to do this weekend, please go on Apple Podcasts and review us with a five-star review. You can also follow us on Instagram at Fan Counters Live. Over 28,000 people hang out at Fan Counters on Facebook. And if you want to join the private group, you can do it. Just send a request. Uh, to join Sharpie Nation on Facebook. That's going to do it for me this week. Next week, I'll be back with a guest host, Bubba Bradley, and we're going to talk a little smartless again. (laughs) Have a good week, everybody. Bye-bye.